Now, overall, what we call all of the stuff that we're talking about in terms of the way gases behave, we call it KMT, Kinetic Molecular Theory. Lots of times we don't want to say the whole thing, but we're talking about the fact that gases are in motion all the time. Their individual molecules or atoms are always in motion, and they explain all sorts of things that gases do, including effusion and diffusion. Now, I mentioned diffusion. This is when you see a gas going from whatever it is in through a tiny hole into a region of lower pressure. It's the reason why balloons gradually deflate, because, you know, you have a a rubber style balloon. It's not perfect. There are tiny holes in it, very tiny, but the gases, you have to blow hard to get that balloon to inflate. So those gases are under pressure. They stretch the balloon to match that. And then there's tiny holes. And so once in a while, one gets out. And eventually you notice your balloon is getting smaller because the gases are gradually escaping. But it is something one can study more to examine more about individual gases. Graham was the fellow who did a bunch of this, all right? He actually came up with a law for it after doing a lot of observations. And what he discovered was that how fast it escaped was inversely proportional. Okay, so I got to remember if I want it to go fast, I want the rate of escape to be fast. It's inversely proportional to the square root of the mass. Okay, well, I'm going to forget about the square root for a minute. I know the square root goes up as the mass goes up, right? So I'm just going to talk about the mass. So when the mass goes up, oh, the rate of effusion goes down inversely. Now, what are the primary tenets of kinetic molecular theory? Well, first of all, the molecules themselves are very tiny in comparison with the volume that they're occupying. In other words, they're each far apart. These gas particles are far enough apart, they don't interact with each other. So they're far enough apart that the intermolecular forces we study don't have any effect the collisions that they do undergo, they're far apart, but every once in a while they're going to impact with each other. They are what are called elastic. They're not going to lose any energy. That's what that really, at the bottom line, the energy is going to be conserved. It's not going to get lost in deformation. You know, when we th think about collisions, we think about like car crashes. And after the crash, the cars are no longer going as fast as they were before. But cars got all crunched up. So the energy went into deformation instead of remaining as speed. So we're saying these are elastic, more like balls on a pool table. They bounce off of each other. The balls don't crunch up. And so what we have is... Or ever wonder what temperature is and why they keep telling you temperature has to do with motion, we've got this definition that the average kinetic energy, well, we know that has to do with speed, of the molecules, well, that average energy is going to be proportional to the absolute temperature. So we're using temperature as a proxy for talking about the speeds of molecules. Okay, so I said that we were going to use temperature as a proxy for the motion you know, of the molecules. Well, any individual one is traveling differently than another one. You know, they all have their own individual speeds. So how are we going to do that? Well, what we're going to use is something called the root mean square speed. Now, I know you're used to V being used for velocity, but since volume is something we're working with explicitly in this chapter, we're going to tend to use U instead of V for a speed so that we don't accidentally confuse ourselves. I mean, it's confusing enough already. We don't need to court extra trouble. So if we talk about the root mean square speed, we're talking about a particle that has what is called an average kinetic energy. And the particle speeds are inversely related to the particle mass. Oh, why is that? 
Well, because we were talking about kinetic, kinetic, oh, like kinetic energy. Well, kinetic energy has within it also mass. In fact, when I calculate kinetic energy, I talk about one half mv squared. We know this is kinetic energy is equal to one half mass and then velocity squared. And I am using a v right now because that's how you know that formula. I will go ahead and change that to use the u. So u squared. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to use u from now on. That means that if I wanted to rearrange this a little bit, I could say that m u squared was equal to twice the kinetic energy. That also means I'm going to try to get to this u because this is a root mean squared, right? So let's go ahead and also divide by m. So here's two kinetic energy divided by the mass. And ultimately then, I say that u is the square root of twice the kinetic energy divided by the mass. This helps explain why some things look a little different than we would normally think. But this is what we're going to call u r m s, root mean square. Well, I see the root. So what else can we look at within this picture now? You see, if we had a perfect distribution, that would be a bell curve sort of thing. And we don't find that it's a perfect bell curve. If it was a perfect bell curve, we wouldn't have to go through quite as many of these acrobatics with the math that we're doing. But the fact of the matter is the particle speed, it's a, it's, it can never be negative because it's speed. So zero is the least it could ever be. It can't go past this, and that forces where over here it can go down to, well, I can't find anything that's going that fast, all right? But over here, zero, there's always going to be a certain number that at any moment are just not moving at all until they get hit by something else, and then they start moving again. So that means that there's multiple ways that you can figure out the average speed. Oh, good grief. All right, well, I told you the one that we're going to use. We're going to use this root mean square. And it's actually up here in the distribution. That's interesting. Because you see, if you were trying to find the most likely speed, it's lower. And the average speed, if you just took a regular average over all of them is also lower. So this is the highest of the three types of ways that you can examine it. And all of these follow that same sort of a distribution, although they get stretched out more as you get to the lower mass particles. They get stretched out more. It's possible for these lighter ones to end up going faster. This is where I use like a football analogy. If you have those big linebackers, they do not move very fast, but they still have just as much kinetic energy. If you have somebody who's out there trying to catch a pass, you want them to get away from everyone else so that they're completely open so they can catch the pass. So they're the lighter people on the team because then they can move and they can dodge and everything else. All right, so let's try to make this fit with what we were talking about in effusion and diffusion. We're going to talk about their speeds. If we have gas A and gas B, two different gases that have two different masses, particles of gas A might have higher speeds than particles of gas B. If they do, they're going to collide more often with the walls of the container. Okay. And if there's a hole in that container, well, they're going to collide with the hole and go through it more often. So we have this as a basis for why it could happen. Now, why would gas A have a higher speed than gas B? Let's look at that for a minute. Let's say they're at the same temperature, right? So we're talking about gas A. And we're just going to do this twice the kinetic energy over the mass of A. We're going to say the same thing about B. Now, mind you, these things are going to have to be 
set out so that we're saying that the kinetic energy is the same because the temperature is the same, right? Okay, here's mass B. So these average speeds are different even though they're at the same temperature. Well, let's talk about how the speed of A compares to the speed of B. Then I can set this up and put the two stacked up above each other, right? Kinetic energy, mass A. Kinetic energy, mass B. All right, now let's make it look a little nicer. I'll just put square root of the whole thing, right? But hey, we said it was at the same temperature. So the kinetic energies are the same because the temperature is a proxy for kinetic energy, right? Boom, these are gone. Let's clean this up a little. When we do, we find out mass B over mass A. So this is what we end up getting. So here we have the effusion rate of A. Because it's going faster, right? It collides more frequently with the walls and it collides more frequently with the hole. That, that happens when the mass of B is more than the mass of A. So the lighter ones get out through the hole faster. So let's do a practice problem. Well, what does this say? It says an odorous gas, okay, emitted by a hot spring, was found to effuse at 0.342 times the rate at which helium effuses. What's the molar mass of the emitted gas? All right, they gave us a couple of things. They gave us a comparative rate and then they told us what they were comparing it to, helium. That allows us to say, hey, I can go look up the molar mass of helium. That will help me because I have a formula I can use. And I don't know what x is. I don't know what that mass is going to be, but that's okay. I'll put it into the equation. And I will discover that I can write this down, the rate of x compared to the rate of helium. That's the 0.342 they were talking about because they were saying times the rate at which helium, okay, so this would be 0.342 times the helium rate, right? So that's how we've set this up and then we have this and then we'll just continue on and fill it in a little bit, all right? If I'm going to be looking at the molar mass of the helium compared to the molar mass of the one I don't know, I've removed that square root sign by squaring both sides. So this 0 0.342 that I had also needs to be squared. I put that in. I'm going to use more sig figs than I've got for the moment. That's the whole thing that was given to me on my calculator. And then I can say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. This is known and that is known. When I rearrange things then, I will be saying molar mass of helium divided by this number. When I put the molar mass of helium in, as well as this, I come up with 34.2. And that's okay, because they didn't say anything about what is the gas. They just wanted to know what this was. Now, notice this was a pure number. This was in grams per mole. So this is also in grams per mole. And that's how we finish that. So even though they did not tell us to identify the gas, we could go take a look. After all, they said it was smelly. If you go and you find out about hydrogen sulfide gas, you find out that it smells bad. It has a molar mass that is a little bit less than what we came up with for our prediction. But, you know, three sig figs, if I look at this in three sig figs, you know, this would be 34.1 if you rounded it and you'd say, oh, that's pretty close. That could be it. So this kinetic molecular theory helps explain why effusion and diffusion works. Diffusion, now we've talked about effusion, so let's talk about diffusion is where it is spreading through other things. So for example here, this looks like a sample of air, it's a lot of nitrogen and oxygen, and then something else. What is this? Well, I'm not even going to speculate on what it is. I'm just gonna say it's something else within the air. And it just bounces around, and depending on what it hits, 
and what the speed of that is, then it ends up bouncing. This explains why odors will spread throughout a space because it's just bouncing here and there. One way that we try to figure these things out is to use the concept of a mean free path. What does that mean? Well, what it is is how far can I go before I bump into somebody else? So I'm just, I have a particular speed and a direction, so it's a velocity, right? And eventually I will accidentally hit something else. So you can see that they have different distances here, right? Different distances between the collisions, but none of them is particularly long or short. So you could do sort of an average, and that's what we mean in this particular case when we use the word mean. We are talking about it mathematically as an average.